Aluminium is a lightweight metal with a ton of different uses, from aircraft to buildings to drink cans. And most important from my perspective is that it's used in a number of technologies related to the energy transition. These include electricity networks, battery packs, solar power, and electric vehicle chassis. Demand for these technologies is projected to increase enormously over the coming decades, and aluminium production will have to increase along with it. Unfortunately, aluminium production is also responsible for more than a gigaton of CO2 globally in 2021, nearly 3% of global emissions. Since we're going to need aluminium as part of the transition, we can't exactly stop producing it. That means we need to find ways of producing it without the CO2. Fortunately, engineers are figuring out ways of doing just that, and in this video, I'll explore what technologies we'll use to eliminate emissions from aluminium production. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. There's no I in team, but there's two I's in aluminium, at least if you're not from North America. If you are, you've probably been wondering why I haven't been calling it aluminum. The good news is that both are correct, so you don't need to spend any time commenting on my pronunciation. Instead, you can scratch that itch by heading over to any of my wind energy videos to tell me that I'm pronouncing turbine wrong. You'll be in good company. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Back to the topic at hand. Whether it's aluminium or aluminum, how do we make the stuff? The first stage of aluminium process is mining. Aluminium is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust, but it's almost never found in its elemental state. It's much more commonly found as part of bauxite, which is an ore made up of about half alumina, that's aluminium oxide, alongside various other minerals like silicon, iron oxide, and titanium. Bauxite was named after Le Beau in France, where it was first discovered, and the largest deposits we know about today are located in Australia, Guinea, and China. Once the bauxite has been mined, it's refined into alumina. The most common way this takes place is through the Bayer process, which is used for 90% of aluminium production. The Bayer process involves heating the bauxite in a pressure vessel along with caustic soda to form sodium aluminate, and then aluminium hydroxide is precipitated out from that. At around 150 to 200 degrees Celsius, the aluminium hydroxide crystallizes while other materials either don't or they take much longer. Then the aluminium hydrate particles are calcined at around 1200 degrees Celsius to remove the water, resulting in anhydrous alumina. This stage is responsible for about 15% of the emissions from aluminium production, mostly because of the high temperatures needed for those reactions, and traditionally that's come from burning fossil fuels to generate heat. 90% of the alumina we produce goes on to be made into aluminium through the smelting process. This part uses electrolysis, and it is by far the most energy and emissions intensive part of producing aluminium. A smelting process takes place in small cells. A large smelter would have hundreds of these cells lined up in rows. Inside the cells, alumina is dissolved in molten cryolite that creates a conductor environment at around 960 degrees Celsius. The bottom of the cell works as the cathode for the process, while the anode is made up of carbon. An electric current is applied to the anode and cathode, and electrolysis occurs in the conductive mixture. The charge causes oxygen atoms to join with the carbon in the anode, leaving molten aluminium on the cathode and carbon dioxide on the anode. This process requires an enormous amount of electricity, around 15 megawatt hours to produce one tonne of aluminium. The aluminium then goes on to the cast house. There, it's remelted to remove any remaining impurities, typically metals like iron or copper, and at the same time other metals like manganese can be added to make alloys. The pure aluminium or alloy is then cast into molds where it solidifies. This ends the production process, but not aluminium's life cycle. After aluminium ingots leave the smelter, they'll be manufactured into drink cans or solar panel frames or bikes or planes. After the aluminium has finished its first life as one of those products, then it will likely make its way to a recycling plant. Aluminium can be recycled an infinite number of times without degradation, and it is one of those good news stories where not only can we recycle it, we actually do. That's because the energy needed to recycle aluminium, including transport and sorting, is dramatically less than that needed to make virgin aluminium. Dramatically less energy use equals dramatically lower prices, and as a consequence, about 75% of all aluminium produced in human history is still being used in one form or another. It's an ideal material for a circular economy. But despite this, recycled production currently only makes up about a third of the global total. The biggest producer, China, has one of the lowest recycling rates. Recycled production there is only about 20%. This isn't because because Chinese people don't do cash for cans, but because most Chinese aluminium is exported, usually in the form of consumer goods. When those reach the end of their life cycles, other countries recycle it domestically. They don't send it back to China. 
Increasing the amount of aluminium from recycled production is going to be quite hard in the short term because recycling rates are already pretty high. Today, about 70% of aluminium from end-of-life scrap is recovered. This can be improved by better sorting methods at waste management facilities, taking efforts to channel end-of-life scrap back to aluminium producers, and by providing incentives for product manufacturers to make their products easier to recycle. Other actions can be taken to improve material efficiency, including things like improving manufacturing yields and cast houses, reducing how much we need to produce Produce and using stronger aluminium alloys for certain applications, allowing for less aluminium to be used overall. Growth in demand for aluminium is increasing though, and it's expected to continue to. Even if recycling rates went to 100% and other material efficiency strategies are introduced, primary aluminium production will need to continue for decades at least. So we need to figure out how to get rid of the emissions in primary production. So let's talk about the technologies in development to do that. The main sources of emissions I mentioned earlier are in alumina refining, process emissions from carbon anodes and fossil fuel combustion used to generate electricity for the electrolysis process, accounting for about 60% of all emissions. The latter contributes by far the most emissions, but happily, those are the easiest to eliminate. The amount of electricity required for aluminium smelting is enormous. Globally, smelters use about 3% of global electricity, and locally, it's even more significant. In New South Wales, a single smelter in Tomago uses about 12% of the state's electricity and New South Wales gets about 60% of its electricity from coal. Globally, the situation is similar. More than half of the electricity used in aluminium production comes from coal. Most of this is because of China, which produces a little over half of the world's aluminium and still has a grid that primarily relies on coal. Okay, so here's a solution. We transition global electricity grids to renewable energy instead of fossil fuels. And wait a minute, aren't we planning on doing that anyway? For the emissions that come from the electrolysis part of the process, it, it nearly is that simple. Outside of China, hydro is by far the largest source of electricity for smelters. That's because in favourable locations, it's historically been very cheap and reliable. You can't move a hydro dam to be close to major electricity users, but you can choose to locate a smelter in places that happen to have great hydro potential. Because of this, there's a very high correlation between regions with lots of aluminium production and lots of cheap hydroelectricity, such as Quebec, Norway and Iceland. Even though those places have relatively small populations where no bauxite is mined, Canada is the fourth largest producer of aluminium in the world, nearly all of it in Quebec, Norway is eighth and Iceland tenth. To drive the point home, the Manapuri Hydro Power Station in New Zealand, which is the second largest power plant in the country, was built specifically to provide cheap power for New Zealand's only aluminium smelter. More recent fluctuations in the power of electricity in New Zealand have even made the smelter unprofitable over some periods, threatening its closure and leading people to wonder what on earth to do with all that hydropower if there isn't a smelter to use it. This also explains why Australia, which mines more bauxite than any other country and produces the second most alumina, were only the sixth largest producer of aluminium, as the Australian grid relies mostly on more expensive fossil fuels. And as a result, we export much more alumina and bauxite than aluminium, and the aluminium we do produce is pretty emissions intensive. But we're transitioning to renewables pretty rapidly, so these emissions will decrease accordingly. And there are also technologies being developed to help smelters see a smooth transition towards a net zero economy. Aluminium smelters traditionally can't vary their energy use very much. That means that the cost of their operation varies with the cost of electricity, and in Australia that price varies a lot, from negative $1,000 per megawatt hour when there's a whole lot of solar power in the grid and not much demand, to over $15,000 when there's a supply shortfall. So you can see that for a large electricity user connected to the electricity grid, there's a strong incentive to be able to reduce power usage during shortfalls when prices are very high. To a certain extent, smelters with standard technology can do this and have. I mentioned Thomas go aluminium earlier. In normal operation, it uses a constant 950 megawatts, which is about 12% of New South Wales total. But when needed, it can shut down around 600 megawatts within minutes by cycling individual pot lines through a carefully controlled curtailment. To take it further than this and make it an everyday tool to follow renewable generation and the associated low electricity prices, new technologies are needed though. One that's in development is the MPOT system, which would allow smelters to turn their electricity usage up or down by about 30%. The MPOT system system covers the sides of each pot with heat exchangers connected to an external ducting and suction system. This allows power usage to be changed while maintaining pot temperature and preventing process disturbances. Once we get to the point where aluminium smelters can be turned up or down by 30% or more, there will be a great match for variable renewables and help achieve several goals at the same time. Lowering emissions, increasing the efficiency of the grid and lowering the cost of smelting. So things are looking promising on the electricity side. Emissions from carbon anodes and alumina refining though are gonna be much harder to eliminate, but solutions have been emerging, so let's talk about them. 
One way to deal with these process emissions is through carbon capture and storage. This tends to be much more difficult for aluminium than other facilities though, as the CO2 concentration in the off-gas for aluminium facilities is only about 1%, while for fossil fuel power plants it tends to be at least 4%. Despite this, Norsk Hydro, the largest aluminium producer outside of China, has announced that they plan to use CCS to capture emissions with the goal of an industrial scale pilot by 2030. The plan involves using closed cells for the smelting process, resulting in more concentrated emissions which can be captured more easily, with any remaining emissions being captured through direct air capture. Another method would be to eliminate anode emissions entirely. An anode is needed for the electrolysis process to pull the oxygen atoms away from the aluminium, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a carbon anode. Inert anode have been developed that can perform the same role as carbon anodes, but release oxygen instead of CO2 as they degrade, and they do not result in CO2 emissions from the baking process of carbon anodes. The anodes were developed in two separate pilots, one in Russia and a joint venture of Alcoa and Rio Tinto located in Quebec. They've both successfully used inert anodes to make aluminium for the first time in 2021. Assuming clean electricity is used for the smelting process, the result is near zero emission aluminium smelting. That still leaves alumina refining, which you might remember needs temperatures around 150 to 200 degrees Celsius. That's actually not such a hard temperature to reach without fossil fuels. A range of zero emissions technologies can reach that high, including some that I have featured on this channel before. Several Australian initiatives have been undertaken to this end, including a Worsley refinery that successfully used 30% biomass in its fuel mix, and a Yarwin refinery that's attempting to pilot the use of hydrogen, which can be emissions neutral depending on how it's made. Additionally, a Pinjara refinery is set to, in 2023, begin piloting a process for electrocalcination, which, remember, needs temperatures of around 1000 degrees Celsius. Once a trial like this succeeds, the zero emissions alumina could then go onto a smelter powered by zero emissions electricity using inert anodes, and then we'd have zero emissions aluminium for the first time. Thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team who support this and every video on the channel. If you'd like to join us and make suggestions for upcoming videos, then you can join us at this link. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.